All right, we are live with uh, JP. How are you, JP? Doing great. How are you doing, Sonny? I am doing well. Uh, just took a little stroll outside with the kids. You know, it's nice, fresh air, uh, brisk winter morning in Canada. Nothing, nothing <laughs> to complain about. Um, yeah, yeah. It's it's you know, given given global circumstances, I'm gonna say I'm I'm doing pretty pretty damn well. How about you? How's your how's your day shaping up? It's going great, you know, just, just starting the morning with this interview and I'm excited to jump in and mm. learning and talking. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. So, so I usually start at the uh, point of like where we usually met. And, you know, some people are like, we met in 2011 and so my friends, I met them back in 2017. But I should call it the pink elephant in the room, which is that you and I met quite recently and it was, you know, a cold uh, reach out. Um, but, you know, I, I try and use my limited spidey senses and try and, you know, bring in uh, people that I don't know. I've, in fact, out of my 35 or what, 40 kind of interviews I've done thus far, you know, three or four of them have been kind of like this. And I'm, I'm mm -hmm. actually really excited about that because, you know, I have a limited number of people that I know. I still have quite a few of them, but um, <laughs> a limited number of people. And so the fact that people out there are somehow through the magic of the interweb are learning about me and, and kind of getting to me before I even learn about them is it means that this thing is working. <laughs> yeah, no, we actually, I just interviewed Jamison Loop for my own podcast I have called Digital Gold. And uh, that's how we found Sweet. you because we saw him, you were on his website. We're like, oh, you know, let's reach out to crazy. Sonny. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. I love Jameson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a friend of Jameson's, a friend of mine. Uh, okay, so so we're new acquaintances, but again, whenever I meet somebody from Bitcoin, I feel like I've known them for a long time just because, uh, you know, it seems like we always have a lot of comment. But let's start with uh, your story. And, and again, you know, for those commenters who are like, you know, you should speed up the intro part. Uh, well, that's kind of the point of this podcast is that my, my goal is to kind of capture some of, you know, the early happenings in people's lives and what they've been doing and, and, and what the lens that they were looking through, which enabled them to, you know, uh, take Bitcoin seriously and then eventually dedicate their lives to it, right? Uh, which I think most people outside of our ecosystem would think we're nuts, right? Like, what? Mm -hmm. You actually work in Bitcoin? Like, that's a thing? <laughs> so, so let's start there. Yeah. So for me, you know, before I got into Bitcoin, I was, I actually got into Bitcoin when I was a freshman in high school. So I was fairly young, but before I was doing Bitcoin related stuff, um, I had a robotics camp, a summer robotics camp that I was hosting um, from actually a friend's basement. And we won, we ended up building that camp because we won the North Carolina robotics, Mindstorm robotics competition called FIRST. Um, they have this thing called FLL, which stands for FIRST LEGO League. We I was a up... judge. Oh, nice. I was a judge. <laughs> I kid you not. There's proof of it somewhere. <laughs> okay, continue, continue. So we were doing these, these, you know, these building these Mindstorm robots and programming them. And we ended up winning first place. We're like, wow, how, how, we, how are we going to, you know, capitalize on this? And potentially... Wait, where, where in the heck are you? Where in the world? Sorry, just for people who don't know. I was in uh, North Carolina. Um, North Carolina, in, right. Okay. Yep. In the U.S. and um, just w was running the, you know, running the programs there, building the team, building with the team. And then after we won, we decided, you know, me and my other friend, well, how are we going to make some money doing this? And so we started, um, we started a camp and got 10 people to come to his basement and uh, mainly homeschoolers and basically work during the summer for a week. And that was the first mm. time I realized, wow, I could charge, you know, $150 per kid, make 15 mm you know, make $15 an hour per kid and have them come for 15 hours during the week. And after that happened, I started to build some, some income, started to build some, some revenue. And then when I got into my freshman year of high school, that would be the second mm -hmm. year we started doing the camp. I uh, started building up some more, some more income there, but I really learned about Bitcoin through just on my computer, looking, looking around and doing research and the first time I came across it, I actually went to Mt. Gox and I couldn't figure out how to buy the coins. You know, I was only about, let's say, 14, 15 years old at the time. And, you know, with Mt. Gox, you had to be at least 18 to, to buy coins there. And so what ended up happening was after not being able to, to buy any and then kind of it, not thinking about it for a couple of months, I then found out about Bitcoin again. And I said, wow, this thing, this internet money, you know, it looks like it could be cool. Like, what is this, this, this Bitcoin uh, concept and started going down that rabbit hole of learning. And once I realized that there was only a scarce amount of them and that computers, you know, generated these Bitcoins and they could start mm. mining them, okay. I thought that was really interesting. And so not only did I start to build my own uh, GPU miner out of a out of like a, a cardboard crate or like a milk crate where, you know, back then they used to be really 
really effective cases where you would put your motherboard in the bottom of the milk crate and you would lay your graphics cards on, you know, on top of the milk crate and have them um, basically with this, I mean, something called a riser attached to the bottom and attached to the top so that you could get some airflow in between your graphics cards. So I started building, my, built my first milk crate miner in my basement, my parents' Sick. basement, running that there. And then, you know, after we, after I started learning more, I ended up buying more Bitcoins when, on Mt. Gox, actually with my, my mom's passport. I go to her, I'm like, mom, I need your, I need your <laughs> passport. Uh, I'm going to give you the money. We're going to wire it over there and uh, I'm going to buy some Bitcoin. Well, what is Bitcoin? You know, I don't know. It's a st- scarce internet money. And then from there, I started um, just continuing to educate myself and then, you know, educate others. So in, in when I was a freshman in school, actually, Anthony Pompliano, um, who's at Pomp on Twitter and came into my school and started talking about his aspirations and after, you know, about to go to Facebook, I believe at that time and start working there. And I mentioned to him, hey, like, check out this thing called Bitcoin. I think you would really like it. And then um, from there, you know, he ended up going to, to, to Facebook and Twitter or Facebook and uh, Snapchat. And then after that, came back in college and we wound up working on a few Bitcoin projects. But it's allowed me to build connections in this space where you're able to introduce this concept to, you know, the, of Bitcoin and learn about it myself um, for the past seven years now from, you know, learning from great people in the community, like, like I mentioned, Jameson, um, also, in, you know, who also used to live in North Carolina and just build those lifelong relationships. I would go to the, the Bitcoin meetup, which we would have uh, every week in Raleigh, North Carolina. I would go there and meet with a couple people. And when the price was up, you know, 20, 15 people would show up at this meetup. And when the price was down, it would be me and the three guys, you know, the three <laughs> locals. <laughs> but it, that's but how those I got three into guys, Bitcoin. though, those three guys, those are the guys you want to know. <laughs> those are the OGs <laughs> there because they understood how well, it, how big it could grow. They yeah. weren't paying it for the price, but they under, they had the belief that, you know, the importance of fair, sound money. And they understood that Bitcoin was going to change the world. Um, and they were just very early. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I, I, I was just going to say, do you mind maybe pausing a little bit in terms of like, because uh, I just realized like there's a lot, I, th- I think a lot of us kind of take for granted that, um, you know, Bitcoin mining is like, an industry and it's like a like it's like a legitimate proper part of bitcoin etc cetera, etc cetera. but before that do you want i don't know i'd love to hear kind of your take on when people ask what the hell is bitcoin mining how you explain it and then also if you could thread into that explanation something around this idea that it gets harder and that you know that back in the day you could take your laptop and you know mine like 50 whatever bitcoins and today you need these like very complex kind of uh you know computers but did you mind maybe doing your little spiel on that one i'd love it for for myself uh, if no one yeah. else it's a little different every time but um of course <laughs> with, with with bitcoin mining you know it is it is a way to use stranded energy and that energy, when I say stranded, is usually sold to either the grid or not even sold to any consumer at all at a very low cost of, of power because of you know, the nature of having to transport that energy long distances to get it to a consumer and that line loss associated there. So really Bitcoin, I look at it as the buyer of last resort of power. So it will buy the cheapest amount of energy. And all we're doing is a simple energy arbitrage game where we buy the power for, let's say, two cents per kilowatt hour. And we sell that to the Bitcoin network through that mining machine. So those miners will use that uh, for the Antminer S19 Pros, will use about 3,300 watts of power. Now, that's about three refrigerators worth of power 24 7, you know, running in your house. Um, instead of, you know, all they do is make heat. They don't have really any other any other um, byproduct other than they're turning that energy, that 3,300 watts consistently into heat. And then in return is that securing the Bitcoin network because they're doing these hashes, which are looking to find new blocks and looking to process transactions. So each one of these miners is running 24 seven on the stranded energy and is simply arbitraging the power um, through through the machine and then selling it to the Bitcoin network for maybe 10, 20, 30 cents for that same power that we're buying for two cents. Now, how much money you're gonna be able to sell that power to the Bitcoin network for depends on the efficiency of that, that mining hardware. And so, as you mentioned, you know, over the years, those machines have gotten more efficient at turning energy into hashes. And so the first kind of Bitcoin miners were on your computer and then your GPUs, which were the graphics cards, um, 
by the time I got into Bitcoin, into mining, the graphics cards were usually were used to mine Litecoin and Dogecoin and other cryptocurrencies. So when I wasn't actually mining Bitcoin, I had to buy a Butterfly Labs miner, which was a US based company. Um, and their joke was that they would ship their product in two weeks. So, you know, two weeks we'll ship it, two weeks we'll ship it. And they had all these pre orders, all these people buying it. And um, Bitmain actually was just selling chips at that point. And they were the ones to come out and beat uh, the Butterfly Labs team to get a miner to a production. Butterfly Labs had a lot of issue dealing with the heat and exhausting the heat from the miner. Um, their designs were just were flawed. But basically what happened was, was they were working on 120 nanometer chip design. So that means each, between each diode or each gate on the chip, there was at least 120 nanometers. Now on one of the newer miners, there's only seven nanometers um, of you know, between each gate, logic gate. So we've gotten a lot more, we've gotten a lot denser in the, the processing power. But these chips were, were made, um, you know, to, to do these calculations and they got much, they got efficient very, very quickly. And those chips are called ASIC chips. That means they're application specific integrated circuits and they can't do anything else but Bitcoin mine. So you can't have a Bitcoin miner, you know, play Minecraft or have it bring up a website. It, literally wouldn't be able to do that. And all it can do is these hash functions, um, which is that SHA-256 hash function that keeps Bitcoin secure. Why, why did Satoshi incorporate this element of, you know, of it getting harder and harder? I mean, I, 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 my guess is that it has something to do with Moore's law or whatever, but I mean, I'm not smart enough to know, but do you know why? Like, why, like, why not just keep it so that everybody can mine on? And I think a lot of network kind of advertise that fact, right? The fact that, you know, ASIC resistance and, and all that. Um, anyway, I have like a million questions. So, I, but, but sorry, I'm, I'm kind of all over no, the place. Yeah, but, uh, I can try to touch on, on that point. So, you know, when, when, when Satoshi was making Bitcoin, um, there wasn't ASICs out yet for that. So the right. first miner wasn't the CP. And pools either, right? Yeah, the, pools no are, pools either. were not, okay, right, okay. So, okay, so he didn't yeah. even, he, you know, he understood, I believe he probably understood how, you know, computers work and the SHA-26 algorithm and that, you know, eventually someone could build an ASIC for this, this type of algorithm for hashing it. But when he, when, you know, when he was building Bitcoin in my eyes, you know, he understood that, in order to have a, you know, this 20 million, 21 million bitcoins, in order to set that difficulty where it's having every four years, you have to issue that supply at a constant rate. And so, mm. in order for us to issue a bitcoin supply at a constant rate, we have the difficulty adjustments, which is what you're referring to as in, you know, making it easier or harder to mine these bitcoin. Um, so that kind of builds into the scarcity aspect of those coins. That, um, that difficulty adjustment happens every two weeks and it's actually based on the amount of Bitcoin blocks computed in that two week period. So if it was more than 2046 blocks, which is how much it should be um, every 10 minutes, then the difficulty would adjust up and it would make it harder for all of the ASICs to mine Bitcoin. And when I say it makes it hard, when it makes it harder, it simply means that the hash function that these Bitcoins are solving is now higher. So just they're like any hashes before that were above this number, they might have been capable to get a Bitcoin block that would have been rewarded by the network. No longer are we going to reward you for that hash. We're going to actually increase um, the, the, the that hash by 10%. So now all the new hashes to get a Bitcoin block have to be 10% higher than the old one because of the increased block, um, not the increased block reward, but the increased, increased block time. And so that allows Bitcoin to be to fluctuate in, in this where more miners are coming online, it's going to produce coins faster, but then it's going to come back to that same delivery schedule that we all know well, where, you know, 21 million Bitcoins by the end of 2140. And that's why I, you know, that positive feedback loop of, of kind of this competition where there's only so many Bitcoins coming out every 10 minutes and everyone's competing for it. So as people learn more about Bitcoin and start to deploy more capital there, they are competing with all the other miners in the spot. There's only one pizza pie and we all only get to have a portion of that. You can't expand the pie. It, it would kind of break the Bitcoin scarcity model we have if you were to just add new coins to the system. And so at the end of the day, we're all capturing that, that pie. And mm -hmm. we do that by creating more efficient hardware, running more efficient hardware and, and lowering our cost, which mm -hmm. then in turn is using, you know, using uh, cheaper energy, more stranded energy. And that, in my opinion, has a positive feedback loop where that capital you're putting into the miners and your capital you're putting into the energy every month really sets a floor for that Bitcoin price because we are mining Bitcoins at a, at a discount 
um, you know, relative to the price of Bitcoin. And so what I'm what happens is is that those that capital that goes into energy is directly correlated with security in the Bitcoin network. And so every single day right now, miners get paid around 140 million dollars a day to secure that network. But they almost they might only spend let's say 50 million or 40 million dollars in electricity per day. Um, and that kind of function helps bring some underlying value to Bitcoin and underlying scarcity. And what, in my opinion, is what pushes uh, the kind of the next frontier um, in the, the Bitcoin price runs that we see every four years, you know, 2017, maybe 2021 here, 2013, we see these Bitcoin price increases, these hype cycles where all these newcomers come into the space. And at first, you know, it's like, okay, why are these happening? And eventually I realized and started correlating the Bitcoin uh, having event, which also happens every four years, to really start that cycle. When miners, we lose half of our production, something has to give. We're losing, you know, half of our production in terms of Bitcoin. So the U.S. dollar amount per Bitcoin, you know, drops dramatically. It was at 14 cents before 2020, um, during March or May 2020, the last halving, and then it dropped to seven cents per terahash. And so that's how much we get paid on a one terahash basis. Then after you know after hey, the Bitcoin price rose, go hey, ahead. Hey, hey JB, so I I just want to be cognizant of the fact. So I I'm really enjoying this, right? And I I literally have a million questions. Um, and I think I mean if you're down, I'm down to do like a, a make a more of a follow up where we go into all these like different tangents, right? But I did want to um stay on theme a bit in terms of like your story. Yeah. So no, that's... so 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 um so yeah. But I but like I said, I, on a selfish note, I am really kind of enjoying this. <laughs> um, but but let, I but I do want to also like I said for our first conversation, I want to capture your story um a bit and not like pepper you with like a million questions. So so before you got into Bitcoin, you were saying you were in high school. You'd learned about you know Jameson. You know, cross paths with a few big big Bitcoiners. But how the heck did you know? I mean, most people are probably like, "What? Like, why are they talking about mining already? Like, how did you go from interest in Bitcoin to, you know, um, yeah, like kind of the story? I guess before you even learned about Bitcoin, really, what was? Um, and if you've already captured that, then what does it look like after that? Like, once you learned about Bitcoin, like what kind of actions did you take? It sounds like you started getting fa- friends and family interested and yeah, was learning. But like, I heard meetups in there, which again is another common thread amongst almost everybody I've been speaking with. Like, it's the meetups come up at one point, but but what happens? after that how do you like kind of make it real <laughs> yeah so for me when uh, how i made bitcoin real i was doing you know trading online and i started building a product called steam pool and the goal of this product was for for bitcoin miners or for not sorry not for bitcoin miners for computer users for gamers to use their graphics cards when they weren't playing video games to mine digital currencies and so i launched that product um was coding it for about a couple a couple of years and and basically was growing the user base of, of miners at home and we're paying them out through PayPal. So that was one revenue of how I kind of got into the mining game and the software side. And then in addition, I raised um, basically $100,000 from family and friends um, back in 2016, 27, I think back in yeah, 2016. Um, and we started an Ethereum mine. And so with that, we bought a bunch of graphics cards. Really before Ethereum was popular, we were mining Ethereum at close to $12, $13 a coin. And at some some days, you know, in the beginning, we were mining over 500 Ethereum a day. And so you would mine this Ethereum from these graphics cards. They were running in an old, an old yarn facility where they were make, used to make clothes. And they had massive exhaust fans out there. And the miners, you know, were running 24-7 about an hour and a half from my house. So I would, we, we deployed them. And then after, after school, I would get off of school and I would head down to the mining facility, you know, work on the machines, fix the ones that went down. But that's how I got into the crypto mining business. And after, you know, I started to build that expertise, then I was, how do I help other people? you know, either enter the mining business or how um, old were you then at this point, you said I was right around 16, 17 years old. I just really curious. Is that another reason you kind of chose mining because there was no barrier to entry per se? It was just like, if you could learn it, you can do it. They're just like computers. Like you didn't need to deal with banks and regulators and, you know, be an adult even. Right. (laughs) You're you're exactly right. I actually was. I was sitting in an AML KYC compliance class in Charlotte for like at a Bitcoin conference. And I was like, hmm there's a lot to be said about selling Bitcoin. Like there's a lot of money transmission laws. Like I don't want to break these. Um, I should uh, go do something else with like computers and tech. And that's why I got into the mining side. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. Okay. So then what happens? And then well, I guess also why Ethereum? <laughs> why did you guys choose that path um, first? 
Yeah, so it was, you know, a brand new coin, um, just recent, you know, just mm. recently launched. And mm-hmm, we were mm-hmm. like, there's a lot of potential here. So Got that's it. why I jumped into Ethereum mining and, and started there. Also, the ASICs were much harder to get, you know, mm. as I mentioned, I was still waiting for an ASIC from mm. Butterfly Labs. At that time, I still never received it. So I was like, okay. And what were you using to mine Ethereum? GPUs, you said? Uh, GPUs, yep. So we went to, to Newegg and we were like, hey, we want to buy 300 graphics cards. And this was right when the transition was happening where people would only buy one and two to them when these guys would come in and buy hundreds. So they were just getting new to this. They had no idea that crypto mining was going to come in and take all the graphics cards, you know, that Ethereum mining was going to become such a popular thing. And so for us, we were, you know, went into them. We told them we want to buy 300 R9, 390X graphics cards. And from there, we started building out the facility. <laughs> well, I have a question. So from the beginning, and by the way, I'm, I'm even though I, I, I think I told you prior to the call here that uh, I'd helped start one of India's first Bitcoin companies. I'm actually from Toronto. So I've, I've seen kind of the Ethereum thing evolve in front of my eyes as well. Um, but, but really curious. So as everyone knows, Ethereum recently moved to proof of stake and was pretty vocal about the fact that they would do so from the get-go. So as somebody who's that young, um, like, how did you know to be like, okay, well, there's enough of a window for us to do this proof of work mining thing until they move over to something else? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, or were you just like, ah, it's just, it's just the only thing we can do. Let's just do it. <laughs> yeah, well, if you're, you're exactly right. And I think they, they, like, it was like maybe a couple months after launching it that they said they were going to go to POS, maybe I think three or six months. Um, uh, and then when that happened, we were like, oh, well, we have all these miners. Hopefully we can mine something else. But then we also realized that you know, it might take months, if not years to do. And it actually, you know, it has taken years. It's taken almost three, three and a half years to do that since they, since they mentioned it. And so thankfully we were able to ride out that mining train for as long as those graphics cards were, were profitable and were efficient enough to, to mine Ethereum. Um, so that's kind of how we've dealt with it. It was more of just like, well, there's other options. Ethereum's the most profitable right now, um, but hey, we, there's not much we can do. <laughs> Got you, got you. Okay, continue. So what happens after that? So you're running this mining operation, making bank. (laughs) What happens then? Yeah, printing a lot of Ethereum, you know, paying off our investors, selling off the the, the, the coins every month to pay the power bill. We ran in that facility in North Carolina for about a about a year and then ended up driving, I ended up driving all these machines up to Oregon um, because that facility was shutting down. Um, You know, they were had a lot of Bitcoin miners there and they had to, I think the Bitcoin uh, having was just about to happen, um, the second one in 2016. And so when when that happened, we we moved up, we, the having just happened, and they became kind of unprofitable. So that facility closed down, we moved up to Oregon, and we started uh, deploying there as well in another facility, they're called co-location facilities. And there was only a couple back then. But you just bring your miners to them, you pay a little bit more for power, and they provide uh, support and maintenance. And so we were running the facility up there, uh, we had all of our machines in nice server racks, kind of redid them. And then I would actually fly to Oregon every couple months and, and work on those machines until around, um, I believe, 2017, 2018. Then when we end up so- selling the you know selling the investment off and, and liquidating all the machines and then and paying off the investors. What machines were these now? These were still the same GPUs, right? Yep, still the same <clears throat> okay. graphics cards. We had about, like I said, 300 of them. How, how long were they actually, you know? helping you or like producing yeah levels. they mined for about um two and a half years and then they mm-hmm. sat in storage for about six months after that before we end up selling them interesting okay anyway, so, so um okay yeah continue continue so yeah what happens after that so after that is when we miningstore.com really started and that's when um we started it was a shopify store to start and we started getting orders so <laughs> So we were, you know, we had these GPUs. We we're like, we know how to build these machines, and so we started selling individual Wait, rigs. Is, to isn't people. Shopify hostile? Like, do I thought, no, maybe not. No, what am I saying? Of course not. Uh, it's their payment processor or something. Yeah, like that. I mean, uh, Stripe doesn't let Bitcoin miners take payment for for their like you know for our bitcoin miners through credit cards with them right that's, that's what because it is. actually because wells fargo is their bank which does all their their, their clear got it got it the wells fargo doesn't like the bitcoin guys like the bitcoin guys. <laughs> of course of course of course okay okay continue continue interesting <clears throat> so so yeah we, we started mining so.com um and then from there we're we're running these you know we're, we're basically building out these little these these little big these little gpu miners 
selling to people on the internet, anyone who wanted to come, we would, I would build them a case or have a friend build them a custom case and then put the miners in there and ship it out. The problem we were running into was that they were just getting damaged in shipping. Like we would ship it across the U S and this thing would show up, you know, it's a very fine tuned computer and it has been built custom for them. And then it would just show up, you know, mangled because of the shipping company. And we ended up losing some money there. And so we're like, okay, we don't know if this is the route we want to go. So we ended up designing our own um, cases. So our own mining cases, which was these, these four U uh, GPU mining cases and ended up selling, you know, getting a hundred to first to start. And then we ended up getting a thousand of these cases and started manufacturing these machines in Raleigh, North Carolina and selling them into the 2017 and after 2018 in that rally, um, selling new miners to new people that were either mining at home or data centers. And then from there, I, you know, I kept the conversation open, kept learning about mining and wanted to build out a facility, you know, really start scaling a, a real big facility and, and start building out there. And so we started um, a facility, started designing a facility for um, this company in North Carolina that has a GPU, that had a GPU farm and wanted to build one, but they actually use spare tires uh, to make, make energy. So they take the tires and they mm. turn that into power and um, Jason Williams is the, the owner of that company. He's with the, the Morgan Creek team, Morgan Creek Digital. And he, I brought him this GPU miner that I had running in my house, one of my first ones. And I, 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 I set it down. I said, Here is a, here's a GPU miner. Here is how cryptocurrency is made. You know, this, you take the electricity, you plug in this machine, you can start getting paid in your wallet. And uh, the first day I brought him this machine. And then by, I would say, maybe the next week, he's like, okay, let's build one of these facilities here. Like, let's get 400, 500 graphics cards and build this out and actually start is, mining is Morgan at scale. Creek, is Morgan Creek the Palm, is, was Palm related to Morgan Creek? Or sorry, yes. I'm just trying to remember. Okay, okay, okay. So, so they're like an investment firm, right? Yep. So they're in Chapel Hill, actually, in North, right mm -hmm. in North Carolina. It's Mark Yusko um, and Pompliano and Jason Williams. They are all the Morgan Creek digital asset team. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know Jason and Pomp are now starting to do their own thing today. But, you know, back then, that's what they were doing and looking to build, bring um, Bitcoin exposure to institutions. Interesting. Interesting. OK, yeah. So fascinating. Um Okay, so so he's like, let's let's build a facility in the next uh, okay, the, like a week after, then one yeah, exactly. And so then they ended up starting in this closet-like space. So Jason took me into this closet. Um, let's like I would say a, a ten by ten a little um, room inside his warehouse, and it was. Uh, we ended up adding all this exhaust, all this AC to this room because you have to circulate the heat and the, the air through the room. And then I ended up hiring some of my friends to go out and design, to build and design and put all the machines on the racks and connect them all up because really it's, you know, hundreds or not, not thousands of components. And so I ended up building that facility um, there, that little- so, so, so one quick question. So is the, because you mentioned now heat a couple of times, right? I got to ask, so it, it, has anyone figured out how to use that heat as like, like I have heat in my home, you know, people have heat in warehouses. It gets, I'm sure, cold where you're at. Like, is there any way to use that heat or is it to this date, is it still mostly a wasted energy? There are obviously ways to use it. It becomes about the practicality of using that heat. So right now people um, have used that heat, you know, in legal states to grow marijuana outside of their Bitcoin mining facilities. That requires a lot of heat. Um, people are looking at it to there, there are like Bitcoin heaters that you can buy that'll Bitcoin mine and heat your house at the same time. <laughs> um, so there's people, you know, working on that. I know a guy that's actually worked, was working on like a Bitcoin water heater design where like the internal of the water heater would be a Bitcoin miner. So distributing that heat and using it is, is a little complicated at scale mining facilities. We haven't found a way to really capture that heat or make sense. Some people have suggested, you know, running a turbine in there and kind of like uh, using the heat and then uh, using the turbine to to, to process uh, that heat, I guess, and then then generate more electricity. But no one has done it at scale, and I think has seen returns where it really makes sense, where you can make economic sense from that. Okay, wait, sorry, continue. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So. So, you know, so we ended up building that one facility. And then from there, we started getting more jobs um, to deploy in different data centers, like Facebook data centers up in Virginia, all the way um, to building out these mining shipping containers. And uh, we had multiple energy companies, you know, started to reach out and saying, hey, we wanted to get Bitcoin exposure, or we have our own little problems and issues with, with connecting to the grid. And so this one shipping, uh, this one uh, solar company reached out to us and they asked us, they basically told us about their problem. And their problem was that they need to, needed to get their, their, in their credits or their financial credits um, from the federal government 
for generating solar power, but they couldn't sell it to anyone. And so one of those requirements is you have to be able to sell that power. And so we ended up putting a Bitcoin mining container on their solar farm in order for them to sell power to us to get those renewable energy credits. And so we started seeing all these what? Little, yes, so we started <gasps> seeing these loopholes. Crazy. Okay. Okay. Ah. Uh, okay. Yeah. No. No. That 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 is super fascinating for sure. Um, sorry. I, I, did you hear about this? There's this guy out in Alberta and Canada here that that's like going to all these. You know where people like dig oil. They have like byproduct. I'm gonna butcher this, but they have like byproduct gases that like. And then they have to pay the government for polluting. Mm -hmm. This guy figured out how to take that gas, that waste gas, and like run Bitcoin miners with it. Um, and he's yeah. turning what was a cost center into a profit center. So the fact that there's like, like, you know, ah, it's so anyway, so someone's got to write like a blog or something on like the connection between like energy and Bitcoin and how people are like arbing it. But anyway, so, what, so tell us, tell me more about this kind of story here. Yeah, it, well, I mean, that's going back to the, the beginning. Energy is the fundamental building block of a Bitcoin, that stranded energy. So this was an example of stranded energy, the solar farm. They needed to, they had this stranded power that was you know, out running for a year, didn't have anywhere to put the power because they couldn't connect to the grid. The grid was right there. You know, it was 20 feet away, but the utility company had wasn't able to connect with them yet because they had such a long line of requests. Um, and so in order to get that tax credit, they needed to fin finish the project um, by the end of 2018. So we had more projects like that happening and actually you're referring to the natural gas type of processing. Um, I believe that's Steve Barber from Upstream Data who you might that's be referring the guy, to. That's the guy. And, and Steve's <laughs> done, a, done a great job of, of turning this, this waste product into Bitcoin. He's done it at a much smaller scale. When I mean that by smaller scale, I mean individual units like 300 KW, maybe even 100 KW. Um, and when we when we now build out mining facilities, we, we go to the five megawatts or 50 megawatts or 100 megawatts scale. So it's really about just massive amounts of energy consumption that's now stranded and on the grid. But all these facilities have, you know, all this energy is the same problem. It doesn't have a buyer and it's either being sold um, for sometimes during the during for negative pricing during the night um, when no one really needs it and that's an issue for not only the energy companies but for you know the grid's overall stability the reason why it's sold for negative amounts of dollars um, is because of the federally is because it's federally subsidized so all of these renewable energy uh, that's being deployed are subsidized by the US federal government. And so the way that works is that one of the subsidies is they get a production credit. So whenever they generate electricity, they get paid two and a half cents, no matter what. So the power doesn't have to be bought by anyone for anything. It just has to be sold to the grid. And so sometimes that power price will drop in the negatives because there's all these people trying to sell power and no one wants to buy it. And so we try to find those places in the world where we're able to offer long-term power contracts with renewable energy companies in order to um, buy their power at a discount. That is wild. Uh, hey, just on before we move on from this topic, though, uh, can you just talk about a little bit, of, or if you're even aware of, I heard that like in China or even in Canada, similar things are happening, right? Where you have these like, I don't know, maybe even, I think it's like, coal or whatever power plants that essentially generate energy and they don't have a buyer and so this is like what you're talking about is happening like around the world right it's, it's any metrics on it like do you have any idea on like like how like that's crazy okay sorry continue yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, i mean it, it is crazy and the thing is is the energy industry i don't have any good numbers or metrics about how much power is generated that's wasted but it 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 is very interesting to see how we've transitioned from coal and natural gas um, power plants into this renewable energy space. How they've done it is really by incentivizing and giving great tax credits on the renewable energy side, and then by disincentivizing coal production by putting regula regulation in to make sure that there there's not you know that there's no carbon or I guess bad you know when coal when coal's combusted it creates these these bad uh, byproducts into the environment so they have to make sure you clean that coal and that's called clean coal now so they've put in more regulation on the the fossil fuel side of the business and they have created more incentives on the green side of the business and so that's really shifted the focus of the energy to that type of production but we still have that core problem which is the production isn't actually to get people power and make their power prices go down 
Um, like here in Austin, Texas, we pay 17 cents per kilowatt hour. At a Bitcoin mining facility, we're paying two cents per kilowatt hour. So the goal necessarily isn't to drive the price of energy down for everyone across the world. It's just to, it's really incentivizing these developers to put power in places that it doesn't really need it but they're still getting the incentives, they're still generating energy, they're still building the grid. What happens is these grid regulators or these grid operators that own and operate the grid will keep those, keep those prices um, you know, above what they should be, above fair market value, because that grid is usually owned by um, one entity or one public utility in the United States at least. And that utility can regulate the rates and it has its costs, but it doesn't provide a free market where anyone could, you know, buy power from anyone because that last kind of leg of the power production problem or process is that uh, transmission. And, and JP, maybe I'm jumping ahead a bit, but I gotta ask this here. So, um, so, so, can you talk to me? So you're saying how Bitcoin, and I'm gonna again butcher what you just said earlier, but you were essentially saying how Bitcoin is anchored to energy, right? To some extent, free energy. And, and can you talk about how now, like I think it was like a week or two ago, Ethereum has moved over from proof of work to proof of stake and how that's like fundamentally different. And like, what is that um, dependent upon? Cause it's not energy anymore, right? It's mm-hmm. something else. It's like, yeah. So, and, and then got, what are your thoughts on that? And yeah, I'd be curious. So the Ethereum blockchain, as you mentioned, you know, December 1st, they had this upgrade December 1st, 2020 that they've been mm. talking about, as we mentioned earlier for a while. And that's a transition to proof of stake. I don't know. I don't think it's completely proof of stake yet. And I don't know. I think it's now just going to be phased out. And the main reason is what is because they don't they believe or I think Vitalik from the beginning, he said that he thinks that proof of work is kind of a waste of energy. And, Mm -hmm. you know, there should be a more efficient way of of solving this this riddle. Right. And so. So, yeah, I guess like I'm really curious about your perspective because you started with Ethereum mining, you're Bitcoin mining now. Um, Why are you or maybe you're doing Ethereum staking as well or something. But like just curious, what what, what are the attack vectors and, and why would a Bitcoiner you know, maybe be a bit more uh, uh, hesitant to 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 trust a proof because there is that feeling, right? Like people are like proof of stake, it's unproven, and blah blah blah. And but I'm just curious, what are your thoughts on that? So really, yeah, my I mean, my thoughts are that it comes down to this consensus mechanism that we're we're talking about, and that's in order to keep the transactions flowing through the network, in order to make sure that no one's double spending, which is the real, you know attack vector we help solve. So the double spend attack is when you have coins that you try to send two places at once and you spend them both at the same time. And then therefore if only one party actually gets the coins and the other party gets scammed or ripped off. Um, and so what, what happens with that is, you know, that's one of the, the most, I would say one of the most high profile attacks or potential attacks that happen in these systems. So for us, proof of work is a way to make sure that each transaction is valid. And it's, and it's done that through this, this Bitcoin mining process or through the mining process in general. So these, these transactions are aggregated by miners. And then this block is produced by that kind of that, that jumping where the, um, the machines have to get above that hash every single uh, block. And then in order, if they do that, they get the, the, the reward for securing the network and processing those transactions with proof of stake instead of having computers act as those validators, you have people that already own coins act as those validators and they're staking those coins. So essentially they're saying, I'm going to take the ability to spend and use these coins um, on the network and I'm going to put them up in reserve and basically have them earn interest on, on my coins. And that's another way to to do con- to get consensus on the network. Um, I'm not very familiar with the specifics of how POS is able to obtain um, the validation. I'm pretty sure you know it's the same type of they someone is putting up um, a, a, a capital similar with Bitcoin mining. Instead of putting it up in the physical world, you're putting it on a server, which means you have the opportunity to potentially decentralize it more. Um, but then that means everyone can run their nodes. And, you know, it doesn't have as high as startup costs. It doesn't require as, as much energy as you referred to. And instead of it's more of like these people are staking their coins um, or their collateral in order to gain more collateral. And that's what builds the security. So I view Bitcoin mining as almost like a bubble of energy around Bitcoin itself that protects it from any outside intruders. That could be central banks, any type of bad actors. So that ball of energy is there because all these miners are always using that energy. And so you have to use at least that much energy, at least 51% or, or more energy to get to break that 
that ball down and to, to attack the network to have you know that double spend attack or to produce another chain or bad blocks. So with POS, it's very similar where you have all these people staking the coins and people, they don't want to ruin the network because if you already have 50% of the network, you're incentivized to keep the network running, even if you're staking all those coins, because then your reward is going to potentially go down to zero or your value of your asset could potentially go to zero if you are a bad actor and you begin to mess with the network because that uh, affects the security of the network. So that's how I view it is now instead of you know energy on the Bitcoin mining side, it's just become collateral on the network, which is then staked, which is now could be lost if people are bad actors and perform um, maliciously. Wait, hold on. But so, but isn't it the same? So, okay, I love that. So bubble of energy, you're protecting the network, 51%. I get all that, right? Um, I, and Bitcoin miners are incentivized to keep the network in line, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but aren't the stakers in the Ethereum land also incentivized to do the best things, blah, 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 you know, where everything yeah. miners are? And, and where does it, like, I mean, where, where's the main criticism, I guess? Like, if it's not using energy and it's more decentralized, um, like, well, what am I not seeing here? Like, to me, it's, it still sounds like Bitcoin is, I mean, it is the, you know, the, like, kind of the king, if you will, right? And it's, like, the biggest and everyone's the one that everyone's talking about. Um, and so proof of work is kind of, like, proven itself, I guess, if you will. Um, but I'm, I'm having a hard time coming up with, like, a, like a more easier analogy or kind of a like words to figure out like why would I not be for something like because I don't like being against something just because it's against it like maybe I should be more exposed to ethereum right but I do have a hard time and I it just for some reason it feels like it's more centralized but I could be wrong um and it, it definitely has aspects of centralization in there so when I say it's decentralized I, when I was referring to that it's really easy to set up but then what services are running all these nodes running on? Well, if 70% of the servers are running on AWS, you know, is that centralized of these validators? If they're all running on Amazon now, because people are just, you know, starting these things up and they're not actually having their own servers running in their houses mm. um, to run the software now that, okay, now that's a potential uh, attack vector. Hey, so, well, what percentage of people are, are doing it on AWS and in I, I, I don't actually know what percentage of validators are on the POS network for Ethereum, but I do know like when it comes to Bitcoin nodes, there's a lot of people running Bitcoin nodes on Amazon. It's pretty much it's like 60, 70% up there mm. of the Bitcoin nodes are running on Amazon. Um, but, you know, the biggest difference is it's just a different consensus mechanism. Um, proof of work is one consensus mechanism that uses energy. Proof of stake is another consensus mechanism that uses collateral. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Mm. Um, it's just another way to do it. And as you mentioned, people have uh, deployed different versions of proof of stake. This is the first time a major coin, in my eyes, has gone from proof of W, proof of work, to proof of stake. Mm. Um, and is completing that transition. But there's nothing really wrong. And what are your thoughts on it? Do you think they've, they've done it? Like they've pulled it off and it's, uh, you know, like well, I think accomplished? It, no, I think they have to phase it in still. I think, you know, they've got the network upgrade set. They've done a lot of testing, but I think it'll be fully complete once it's proof of work is completely phased out and the network is functioning. Uh, How long properly. will that be? Do you know? Um, I don't really know, but my guess would say at least two years, I would say. Oh, Wow. Yeah, to make okay, sure okay. that, you know, everything, all the attack vectors, you know, any type of potential attack to really prove proof of stake is here to stay. It's going to take a decent amount of time, especially with, with Ethereum and just how big of a chain it is. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So, so I guess just to go back to your story. So what, what, uh, I mean, you, you shared about your story and about mining store and kind of, so where, where are we now in 20, what, 18, 19? Yeah. Where so, you, mm -hmm. uh, 2018, I you know, kept building these facilities. 2019 was you know, very similar, really just started researching more about the financial world and really learned about bonds and how, um, people raise real capital. Cause one of the biggest problems that mining, uh, Bitcoin miners have had is access to, to capital access access to credit um, and being able to build in these facilities. You know, they were starting off smaller where um, in the, the retail stage or back in 2017, it was really just warehouses. And so people maybe had a couple of megawatts of power, if that, you know, a couple kilowatts of power in their, their warehouse and they would be running these Bitcoin miners, but they weren't to the scale that they're now. Now Bitcoin miners are in this industrial scale where they build out full buildings. They're taking power, you know, 50 megawatts of power is about 100,000 houses. And so they're putting 100,000 houses worth of power into one building just to Bitcoin mine and just to secure the Bitcoin network. And so we 
over the years, you know, start, I started researching more and more about how we could uh, bring this, this Bitcoin investment or Bitcoin mining investment, which produces a steady yield and doing that energy arbitrage to other investors, to other people around the globe. Um, and since then, we've been, been sharing the story, built, out a, built another Bitcoin mine in Iowa, um, ended up building that 5.4 megawatt mining facility there. And now we're focused on building a facility in Oklahoma, um, and that'll be a 50 megawatt facility powered by, by wind energy. Um, and so that's kind of how I've scaled and how the business has grown over the years and some of the newer projects and newer, you know, larger size projects we're working on today. That's fascinating. Um, and, and there's no talk about uh, Bitcoin moving to anything else, right? Like it is proof of work kind of uh, like there's yep. no there are no problems that the, the core developers or the miners or the community at large sees within that. Um, right. I exactly. Know. I would say that, you know, majority of the, the Bitcoiners, um, you know, maybe they don't necessarily support proof of, of work, but they do um, understand that it is important to the Bitcoin network and that scarcity mm -hmm. is very important to uh, Bitcoin working out and being 21 million coins. Um, it's also they don't want to they don't potentially want to break anything because it was the first coin Bitcoin uh, won't upgrade as fast as any other coin. So I don't see proof of work going away for Bitcoin. I see it actually becoming one of the most, one of the biggest industries in, in the world, mining cryptocurrency, uh, can, working directly with the energy industry. Um, we was recently talking to a miner in Venezuela, and he said, you know, the, 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 the perception of Bitcoin mining is that it uses all this power. It's a waste of energy. But reality is, is that it, in, in Venezuela, he had to show the, the energy companies that they could actually work hand in hand to the energy that they were generating. The problem they have is no one actually really pays them um, for their energy because it, they have a fixed rate there for power. Um, and so what happens is that these Bitcoin miners can work hand in hand with the power producers like we have done with the solar farm and with the, the waste management company to generate value, to create value, which then can support the grid. So as we see um, Bitcoin mining growing, we see nation states. I see nation states getting into uh, the space and deploying large Bitcoin mining facilities on their energy reserves that they have as a way to create additional value and to compete for these Bitcoins, which are ever scarce and this you know, digital network of, of trust that we're continuing to build uh, with the Bitcoin network. That's fascinating. And, and it, it, but... It's kind of ironic, though, also, right, that, that that Bitcoin was, I guess, somewhat designed to be decentralized and circumvent third parties and arguably, you know, to some extent governments, yet it's you're suggesting that in the end it'll be, you know, a bunch of nation states maybe like mining this stuff uh, just because it's at that scale. So that means leads me to... I guess think or potentially conclude that that you know what Samson Mao and Adam Back and all these guys are saying that it's not about transactions per second, it's about value per second, right? Like mm -hmm. how much value and and maybe Bitcoin just becomes this like massive, massive value network that you know everybody, not just like people, but like nation states and banks and governments, everyone kind of relies on as like a, a backbone. Um I don't know. It's it's fascinating though, man. Like the times we live in right now, with all these like experiments, and and like you said, maybe it's not an either or. Maybe it's like an and. And you know, there's like uh, there's, there's like the world is there's enough space for, um, you know, all this innovation. Fascinating times. Okay, so so I guess anything else you want to share about mining store and I guess like these larger, oh my god, these are like massive operations here that you're talking about. Like just to visually help people visualize, like one of these operations, like you said, wind farm, like, I mean, I've seen these wind turbines, like how big of an operation are we talking about here? Yeah. So you, for us, um, you know, there's, let's say uh, 50 megawatts of, of wind power is about uh, 20 wind turbines. And so these wind turbines are out here in the middle of, you know, middle of Oklahoma um, and just can constantly generating energy. And so that power, we then go next to the substation and we build out a Bitcoin mining facility. Now, what does that look like? That looks like um, a large, a large building with with hundreds of thousands of power of, of kilowatts of power. So megawatts of power, about 50 megawatts of power there. And as I mentioned, that's 100,000 homes worth of power that all comes down to this one area. 
And so what we're doing there is we're saying, okay, we're going to work with all these different energy producers, the wind power people, the solar people, the natural gas guys, whoever it is that has that power. We're going to work with them to utilize the power when no one else wants to buy it. So when they don't have anyone on the grid that wants to buy it, and this is what we do in Iowa, we use that power. But then when they need the power back, and so when the grid um, is getting to capacity, and this could happen because every morning everyone wakes up and they start their coffee and they turn on their heat in the morning or in the afternoon when everyone is going home from work and they're starting to cook and the air conditioning is on, they're charging everything. Basically, the grid has to either generate more power and turn on these, these peaker plants, these natural gas plants, these coal plants that aren't as clean, or they can tell other people to turn off. So Bitcoin miners like ourselves, we act as a demand response vehicle, which simply means that we can adjust our power usage with the grid, working hand in hand, turning on and turning off our Bitcoin miners based on if people are using energy or if the energy is available. Um, okay, does, does Bitcoin mining eventually decentralize itself? Is there even a path towards decentralization where we have like micro economies where, where my I don't know, my solar panels on my rooftop uh, are generating too much energy and instead of selling it, selling it back to the grid, whether they're, I don't even know if there's an incentive or not. I mean, you know, I just mine some Bitcoin with it because I'm not using it. Um, and, you know, like, is there a way to like create micro like commerce in my home where, like I said, where maybe my, you know, my stove or something tells my wash dishwasher, like, hey, look, it's uh, energy is kind of expensive right now. Why don't you just cool off, like uh, turn on in a couple hours and I'll pay you for it. I'm just wondering, like, is, do you, is that is that something that might eventually happen? Or do you think mining is just like going to be delegated to like these massive, massive entities? So I do see mining really being focused on these massive energy entities, but I don't think it's going to keep the little person out or like, you know, the consumer out um, from the industry. So you mentioned a couple of different use cases there, which is like your washer, dryer, communicating the like smart home technology to reduce energy or reduce the time you're consuming energy. So that's been built out. Um, and we've seen that basically that, that, that use case of energy and in conserving energy, the biggest thing for most people is that they can save money on their energy bill. Um, that's when people, energy companies have been trying that for a while. Not necessarily seeing, I don't see Bitcoin miners running at houses. Mm -hmm. What I do see is that uh, the accessibility or the ability to get access to Bitcoin mining as an investment, as a vehicle, yield for, as an investment vehicle in the way to generate yield will continue to drop. And that barrier of entry will hopefully um, be easier for all everyone to, to join and to participate in the network. So I view it as you have these massive mining facilities, which are buying stranded energy um, for you know pennies on the dollar. And those facilities will be held with, will have you know thousands of servers. So like one of the facility that I mentioned in Oklahoma, will have about 15,000 of the new machines in it. And then people will be able to almost buy one of those machines and those machines, not almost, but we'll be able to buy one of those machines. And those machines will stay in the facility, but then will run in mine to your wallet. So you'll be getting the coins. And then when it has to use power or pay the person who's running it, it can switch over to mine for them. And so really it's like almost like paying a hotel fee, where if you think about this, we're building these hotels, these Bitcoin hotels out in the middle of Oklahoma, there we have 15,000 spaces and we're selling you a hotel bed, but it's for a computer and that computer is gonna make you money. So I see that process of decentralizing the network happening where you are taking these large institutional miners and you're giving, um, giving access to individual slots in that mining facility for consumers. Interesting. Um, but isn't that us relying on central parties again, to some extent? You're still relying on an operator, yep, to operate and run the facility. The problem but How is, is it fundamentally different still from our current financial system? I mean, they're, well, it's limited. I mean, and it's open source and there's all these other crazy things about it. But I'm just curious, like, I'm just that, yeah. Um, yeah it's just Bitcoin mining in, in my eyes is, is a great way to generate value. Um, it's one of the only things where you're taking value uh, from, you know, from running that, using that spare energy all the way to selling that energy to the grid. And that value transaction or transformation is always occurring um, through the Bitcoin network. It's one thing that, you know, it doesn't have economic incentives, it doesn't have government incentives that are saying, I'm going to pay you $25 for that power. I'm mm. going to pay you more money. So there's those incentives that are super important that align everyone to make sure that the system works. Well, like a traditional system has a lot of, um, I would say, import 
from third parties that maybe don't make it as much as a fair economy or fair market economy as we expect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is very fascinating. Um, interesting. Uh, okay, so anything else on on kind of, I guess, your journey and and the company before we move on to kind of what some of these final questions here? Not really, Sonny. I think we covered a lot. We really. covered a lot, right? <laughs> we covered a lot, but this is fascinating. If you got like, I don't know, if there's like a website or like pictures of all these things as they come on, man, I would love to like yeah. talk about them. I just find this, oh, this is crazy. Like, awesome. I'm just so, I don't know. I feel so lucky to be alive right now, man. Like, <laughs> like I've, I've, like I told you, I we did a bit of mining back in 2012, 2011. Um, no, it was when the A6 first started coming in. That whole butterfly thing you talked about was like taking me back because like we had butterfly miners and, <laughs> uh, and they were even making the um, the chips and then we were building PCBs for them and, and, you know, doing all that. It was fun. It was fun, but we ended up losing, you know, <clears throat> not money. Like if you look at it in terms of like fiat terms, but um, in terms of like Bitcoin terms, like we, I think we went in with like a hundred and came out with 30 or like, you know, something like that. And we got our, we got burned. Um, but again, you know, timing had something to do with it. I think just lack of, I mean, you need to be fairly, you got to have your big boy pants on to, to Bitcoin mine. It's not like super, you know, like uh, DIY in your basement type of thing. Um, but I wish, I kind of wish that, you know, that, that there'd be certain elements of it that, that maybe became that. And maybe that's like the running the node. Hey, one question. So any thoughts on this new thing? This, what is it called? Stable something? Everyone's talking about how running a node might become like a bad thing. And I don't know, like any any thoughts around how I, like the governments are maybe, I mean, it's about to get worse before it gets better, right? So I guess my question is, is like, yeah. Um, yeah, I haven't, I mean, I haven't, really heard about running a node, you know, potentially being a problem in the US. Um, you know, whenever we're challenging the status quo with these new networks, um, they're going to try to go after any type of, you know, any type of validators and a way to shut it down. And one way to do that is, you know, through the nodes. And they're just, that's why decentralization or having so many nodes is super important there to relay those transactions. But I don't see you know, I, I don't see governments necessarily stepping in and all across the world all at one time to try to shut this down. I think it's already too big and it's growing too fast. And there's too much value that's being locked in Bitcoin and other coins and really too much value being created. Um, and what I mean by that is it's breaking down the barriers to entry. You know, one reason suddenly you keep saying like, oh, I'd love to Bitcoin mine at home. One reason why you just, it doesn't make sense is because the power could cost too much. So the whole electric system, electric grid system is, 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 is messed up it's because it's regulated and that does bring advantages but also brings disadvantages where you now have these rates classes that if you're paying 15 cents for your energy you can't be competitive with someone who's paying two cents that's seven times you know less so that's one of the reasons why you can't be profitable is because of these regulatory bodies that are in the way which you know have done a great job um, regulating their industry and where, you know, had a reason and a spot to come into the world, but now it's coming down where it's, 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 it, does it still make that much sense when we have power being sold, you know, for two cents or for, for negative pricing in the middle of Oklahoma? Why don't, why don't we have that power built, you know, places where it can actually be used or then people don't, can lower their power bill. So that's what I see. It's really these incentives are with these, with these, these, these third parties or these large governments are, they're, they're just they're changed they're not they're not a it's not a free market and so that will affect kind of the forces at play and affects how um this these you know these systems and these software develop and who can access them oh man okay this is uh fascinating so um okay so my my kind of my third uh question is really around you know peter thiel's famous question which is what's one thing that you know, you believe to be true that most others in Bitcoin would maybe disagree with you on? I think what I, you know, what I believe to be true that most others would disagree with me on is that Bitcoin mining um, has the potential to be a, a yield vehicle for the rest of the world, um, giving them, uh, giving people an opportunity to capture steady returns from an investment that's uh, backed by energy and is simply using that strand energy. So what I mean by that is, you know, if we're looking for for yield in the world, yield keeps on dropping when it comes to uh, physical deployments of infrastructure. So those returns continue to drop. And that's why bonds pay out so little, um, you know, down to half a percent, one percent, two percent on the bond length, depending on who's issuing that bond. So that means that capital goes to work for, you know, five, 10 years and is only going to return one or two percent 
percent a year um, to those people that put that capital up. Um, so I think Bitcoin mining has a great way to actually build physical infrastructure, which you know creates jobs, uh, uses physical qu equipment components. Uh, moves items in the supply chain to actually start generating a uh, steady yield for people all over the world. And I think that as Bitcoin mining becomes easier to access, like just like trading your own coins on your phone, uh, we'll see more and more people adopt and start earning an income from Bitcoin mining. Fascinating. Interesting. Interesting. That's pretty cool. Um, okay. I think we covered, you know, quite a bit of ground in terms of, uh, you know, Bitcoin, your stories and all that. I, I had a couple of um, other questions that, you know, I'd be just really interested in hearing your point of view on. Uh, one is AI. Uh, I know most Bitcoiners, hey, JP, did I lose you? Okay. A little technical glitch there. We'll back. Um, okay, so JP, I was asking about, I guess, uh, yeah, just a couple of final questions, um, not necessarily related to, actually, okay, so okay, first question um, is kind of a follow up to the last one, which is um, outside of Bitcoin, right? Um, any, any, any thoughts along those lines in the sense that any truths that you hold today that most others would disagree with you on? And I, and I don't mean within, again, the Bitcoin microcosm, but outside of it. You can pass um, as well. <laughs> yeah, I would say for, for me, any truths that I hold today, I think that, um, you know, people will continue to build really cool value capturing tools with tokens. Um, if that is, you know, the economic value through the mining, through a mining process, if that's almost like social value through, um, through these social media influencers and the attention and fan base they can capture. I think tokens are going to explode in, in use cases, similar to how we've seen with DeFi, you know, with the ICOs previously, we'll have another round of that, where it's about, you know, capturing these, this value that's created in these communities. And hopefully people start, um, I think, I think eventually people will start learning more and more about how to utilize tokens in their day-to-day -day life and how it can help them out. Mm, fascinating. Um, Interesting. And then, and then I guess, yeah, my other question was around like artificial intelligence. So do you think much about that? Do you, have you come across any interesting projects? Is it something that, uh, I don't know, you spent much time on? Yeah, I, I have, I love reading about artificial intelligence. I've never actually um, hmm. worked on any AIs directly, but when it comes to some of the stuff that is intriguing to me is some of the AI slash machine learning stuff that um, recently has come out with like videos. So live videos is a software that'll actually be able to identify different items in a room with a live video feed and be able to do that to a fairly high degree of accuracy, like 98, 97%. So if it sees like a speaker, or if it sees a pizza, or if it sees a bottle of wine, you know, with your camera through, through a live video can actually identify and box each one of those items up. So I think that's huge for kind of just how we see the world and how these computers are able to quickly process that information and kind of provide real time feedback um, to the user. I also see um, AIs and really being popular, obviously, with like the TikTok algorithm and, and using TikTok myself, um, that AI will automatically suggest content to you directly on what your other, you know, how long you watched the video, what you're engaging with, what you like. And that's a great example of an AI in your day-to-day -day life where we don't even, you know, realize it's really happening and we're interacting with one, but what's, whatever is just bringing up those next videos is that AI agent that is basically predicting what we're going to watch next and what's going to keep us on the app. So I see AIs being more ingrained, um, you know, in, in the world today, with all that stuff. And then I also see, you know, AIs we've seen, I think they just came out with something from DeepMind, Google's AI um, side of the business, that they now can do gene sequencing and gene, like gene sequencing to a very high degree of accuracy. Um, so some, like I believe like 99% accuracy or down to like one uh, molecule of, of accuracy and, and be able to produce these amazing results that would take that, you know, we're having issues with before. So that's a huge step in, in the right direction for these really challenging problems that AI and machine learning are now being able to tackle. Yeah. And, and, and so those are, those are, I think, great examples. Um, you know, however, those are, I would call them maybe more like narrow bands of AI. Right. I, I, and I'm curious, have you heard about this like notion of uh, like the technological singularity and general artificial intelligence? And, and I, I know I would sound normally like super weird and it's even weird me bringing this up, but 
there's like people like Elon Musk and people like, you know, like Zuckerberg, like there's like Bill Gates, like people are actually talking about this stuff now as like a, you know, as something we should be thinking about. And I think Elon Musk even said that it's like a far bigger threat than, than like a nuclear war or whatever. It's like, okay. And yet like nobody knows about this stuff, cares about it, or is even like willing to ask questions about it. And the only extent that I think most people have explored it is like Terminator 2. <laughs> I mean, the scale of the computing power that these, um, you know, these check giants have Amazon, Google, Facebook in their data centers is enormous. And so the scale of these AIs running on those computers um, is, 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 is also enormous. And it's showing us that you can have these, these soft, the software run on all of these integrated computers and produce these amazing results, taking complex problems and breaking them down and producing, um, really there, I think the biggest problem right now is we haven't been able to get the real world applications there. So it's more of it to spend like, okay, this is theoretical, like playing chess, you know, or playing different games, um, or the gene editing stuff. That's a really first big leap into like science and technology where it can have a day-to-day -day impact. My guess is over the next two to four years, we'll see more of those things that could impact science and impact how we view the world and physics, but they're more theoretical, you know, calculations. I think that over the next four years will change where these will start to be really applied to the real world. And we'll, we'll, we will might, you know, we will go into more of that singularity aspect that you're talking about. It's just a matter of time. And I think because there's so much computation behind it, so much capital, so much computation. And we're seeing that, you know, Google has the most AI engineers in any company in the US. That's because it's, it's a race to, to make products, to drive, to drive real growth and to drive uh, real innovation. Um, and I think AIs are, are proving themselves to be able to do that faster than, than humans can and at scale. And do you think that poses a potential threat? Like, I mean, and again, as I say this, I always like fear uh, people are going to perceive me as a Luddite, but uh, I, I don't consider myself one. I just like to be pragmatic. And just because something hasn't played out in a certain way in the past doesn't necessarily mean that it won't in the future. And and I wonder, you know, given how powerful these AIs and, and these new technologies are becoming, you know, if you, you don't even need general AI, like just the fact that cars drive themselves is in itself a major threat to tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of jobs around the world. And I just wonder, like, as you play that out further and further, you start to see, well, how even doctors or a lot of what a doctor does could be. And then you look at, you know, things like open AI and you're like, wait, hold on, like even programmers, you can't tell a truck driver, oh, go learn to program because... Uh, AI is going to take care of that too, you know? And so, yeah. so I guess I'm, what I'm getting, getting at is, is that, yeah. Do you, do you um, like worry about that at all? And, 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 and is something like, and again, maybe not a government led Ubi, but maybe like a global open source um, movement towards like a universal basic income needed or, you know, I know again, as most Bitcoiners that that's heresy, right? Like, you don't, you, the last thing you'd want to even talk about is universal basic income, but I do think about it. Cause it's like, I've been to India, I've been to all over the world and there's a lot of people, you don't need to give them millions of dollars. Like if you gave them five dollars a day like they could eat <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know yeah, it's it's a very complex problem and yeah, i think yeah, what yeah. i'm realizing is that you know more people are going from um kind of industrial line workers or people who work you know to just service the the, the area they're working in and they're not necessarily doing knowledge work i think more people are going to move to that knowledge work um, which is more, you know, creates more creativity. And AI has had a hard time uh, doing being creative. You know, it's very good at repetitive tasks, um, like identifying objects or providing you, you know, with whatever content's doing well in, a, in, a, in an algorithm. But I think more, hopefully more people will spend their, their time working on things that are more creative and, and just have more of their time available. When it comes to stimulus and, and, and universal basic income, I, I'm not actually opposed to, to this such, you know, um, I guess, measures because we do see i think in my eyes that you know the government is giving these these large funds and large institutions access to capital for very very cheap if not at a you know zero percent rate so what is the difference between giving it to people i you know i actually would hope that we we do work on how do we stimulate the economy from the individual level the biggest problem with that is is that it's built on this idea that you know everyone pays interest uh payments to the next person up the line and people at the, the top of the collecting all these interest payments need to ensure that everyone keeps paying and so they can mm. they do that by, by keeping more capital coming in the top um and it doesn't you know really matter about anyone else unless if you, so if you don't own property you know you're 
who cares if you pay your interest? So that's one of the problems I think today that we have to deal with in this society before we kind of move to a universal basic income or giving money directly to the people instead of to the corporations. Mm, yeah, and I do wonder if, if blockchain can help usher in, you know, a bit of a renaissance there. And, and I wonder if, you know, if, if we could somehow systematically take maybe some of the profits generated by automation and AI and... Oh, I hate the word distribute, but it's just like when you've been around the world, you've seen so much like poverty. Um, you know, I, I, I can't help but think like, you know, are there technological, like you know, technological open source, private, you know, market led initiatives that might systematically help address a lot of these concerns? Because, um, you know, because like I said, is, is whether it's like job loss today or far into the future, like what if we do give birth to, something that is you know far more capable and that sh i mean you think that would be an awesome thing you think that would be something that we would all be like excited about because like i sure hope that our life purpose isn't just to like work or whatever that yeah. <laughs> is right like what if we could be free to be more artful and more creative and 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 but not have to uh, um Anyways, uh, okay, so anyway, dude, we covered a lot of ground. Um, anything in terms of do you want uh, where people can maybe, uh, well, maybe for, before we get to that, any questions that you wish I'd asked that maybe I didn't? Anything at all on, on the table with Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining, your story, current events, anything you want to bring up? Are we good? Not really. No, I think it was a great, I appreciate the time, Sonny. It was, it was great to talk. Um, yeah. People, you know, they can find me on Twitter. It's at JP Barrick or on okay. TikTok as well. It's How do you spell your last name there? JP? B-A-R-I-C. So okay, JP perfect. B-A-R-I-C. Okay. Yep. And, and where, uh, what else? Uh, miningstore.com is the best place to learn more about what we're working on as a company. Um, and if you're an investor, um, you can check out our investor related content at orumcapitalventures.com. But yeah, no, that's really a, everything about me. And I agree with you. I hopefully people will be spending their time on more creative things in the future. And blockchain can actually enable some of this value that we have ourselves, you know, so I feel with like data, figuring out how we can start optimizing and selling our data. To, to these big companies and get more control of that, I think will give, you know, some, some power back to the people. And then also our attention, you know, we spend a lot of time on our devices and companies make a lot of money showing us advertisements. And so how do you reward people that, um, you know, are either capturing other people's attention through content or are even spending their time on these apps to actually potentially get paid? So I think those are different routes where we can see, you know, kind of UBI be in, in, involved and be invited into our day-to-day -day lives, maybe not from a government, but, you know, from some of these re redoing of these incentive models. Have you ever heard of eToro, JP? I have. Yeah, so there's a guy named Yanni. He was actually the inventor, not the inventor, but his name's on the white paper for colored coins, which oh, okay. is arguably like kind of the, you know, the first, uh, like it was like, Ethereum and all these things were somehow, you know, was, was born out of like this, this iterative, you know, design process of people trying to figure out how to build on top of Bitcoin. Anyway, so Yanni recently uh, launched something called Good Dollar. And it's actually like an Ubi project on top of Ethereum, um, which okay. I find super fascinating. He actually presented at the OECD, which is like the regulators of regulators last year. Um, and, and it was interesting to see, you know, like, again, like a private led initiative that governments are maybe supportive of, or maybe they'll help endorse. But like, I do feel that, that, that's not, like Bitcoin and blockchain, whether it's Ethereum or something else, they're, 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 they're perfect for, for, you know, for, for building tools like that as well. Right. Um, anyways. Okay, dude, this has been a fascinating conversation. I definitely would love to do a follow-up, man. I had so many questions that I didn't ask. I was like, okay, we got to capture his story, but, but I'd love to get back to and, and uh, yeah, you know, drill, drill deeper into. So, uh, so for now, like I said, I'll, I'll uh, post this in the next couple of days and, you know, I'll share it with you, but uh, yeah, it's been delightful. Awesome. No, thanks Sunny, again for having me on. I appreciate it. It was great to talk. Awesome. Okay. So with that said, I'll, uh, I'm going to kill the recording here.